Good morning, everybody. Although in my original schedule, this topic that is pelletization of iron ore was not there because the course is on separation of fines and ultra fines, but it is remotely related to that. And on top of that, so most of you have requested me to discuss this topic. That's why I'm discussing. Okay. So. Pelletization of iron ore fines, if we want to understand that, I know that say actually some of you may be aware of the basics of this, but I would like to repeat that because of the benefit of some of the students or participants who are not aware what is pelletization. So, we have to start with iron ore. Okay. So, what is iron ore? So, iron ores are basically uh, basically rocks and minerals from which metallic iron can be economically extracted because at the very first lecture I have discussed that what is an ore and what is a mineral. So, the ores are usually rich in iron oxide and vary in color from dark gray, bright yellow, deep purple to rusty red. Then what are the different ores? There are varieties of ores for iron. It is magnetite, hematite, goethite, limonite, or siderite. Okay. However, the most common is hematite, and for our steel making purposes, specifically through blast furnace route, we use hematite because of metallurgical, say, actually the restrictions. Okay. Now, this is uh, uh, how a hematite ore looks like it could be a gray or earthy red type. Then these are the basically the magnetite ore, the normally blackish or grays. Then these are basically the goethite, the chemical formula is written there. It is the color is naturally a basically the yellowish to reddish to dark brown. We have got lemonite, which is yellowish brown. Then we have got siderite, these are carbonate one, it is yellow to dark brown or black. Okay. Now, these are the principal iron bearing minerals, you can say study it, this is written there, I do not want to spend much time on that. <laughs> but what I want to highlight here <coughs> that if I want to separate the iron ores from other gang minerals, even within the iron ores, if I have the different type of minerals, you see that how much the variation is there in the specific gravities. So, lowest one is 3.3 and it can go up to say 5.24. So, even many times separation of different iron bearing minerals becomes a problem. So, that means they interfere with each other because of their differences in the physical and chemical properties. Okay. Then you look at iron ore availability world scenario. We all think that we are very rich in iron ore, but it is not. Yes, we have got good quality iron ore, but if you look at the per capita availability of iron ore, probably we are amongst the lowest of the say, major deposits we have in our different countries. You know, It is only 22 tons of iron ore per person. India has the lowest per capita availability of iron ore amongst all these countries. Okay. So, here also we must use it in a say sustainable manner, otherwise maybe the iron ore reserve also will deplete. Now, these are the iron ore reserves, I do not know whether you understand the difference between proven and prospective. Proven means that that is a mineable ore, that means we can do business with that. Proven means and then your prospective means yes there are iron ore deposits, but it is still not proven that whether we can economically extract that or not. Okay. That is why you see that hematite proven is 6.025 billion tons, prospective is another 8.6. So, we have got around 14.63 billion tons. Now look at this magnetite, magnetite prospective is 10.33 billion ton, but proven is only 0.286 billion ton. Okay. So, this is the basically the <coughs> Uh, so, break up of this, but why you are not putting more stress on this? Because our steel industry they want hematite ore, 
for blast furnace operations. Okay. So, our more uh, such major concentration is on hematitic iron ores till today. Now, these are general descriptions of the iron ore, how much we get, what are the uses. So, normally what do we try to do? We try to extract that iron ore in a blast furnace route where we get the product that is called pig iron. So, pig iron is having is basically nothing but a, a alloy between your iron and carbon. So, the metallurgists or even the other engineering students who have taken a course on extractive metallurgy or material science probably you are familiar with iron carbon diagrams. Okay. So, here the carbon percentage is so varies from 3 to 5 percent carbon and later on when you produce steel it is basically you need carbon, but you have to reduce this carbon. So, there are different phases you know. So, so that controls the basically the structure of my steel or the properties of my steel. So, that is the refining stage, but in the blast furnace we produce this peak iron. So, this entire discussion we will concentrate on on say blast furnace. Okay. Now, what is a blast furnace? One day I discussed it briefly. This is also not a talk on blast furnace. Here you see that it is generally height is around 100 feet. Okay. It has got different zones. So, the your raw material is fed from the top and there are temperature gradients from here to here. So, what happens your reaction starts from here at different temperature, but ultimately you get the molten metal here and this different temperature profile I am showing here that is iron forms and trickles down at 400 degrees centigrade when it enters there. Then at 800 degrees centigrade carbon monoxide forms and rises it tries to go out that is the waste gases. Then here carbon dioxide forms and rises that is around 1400 degrees centigrade. What is the melting point of iron? Melting, melting point of iron is 1539 degrees centigrade. So, the temperature has to be more than this and here also I say that look there is a also a gravity concentration method is going on. What is happening? Here when you are trying to melt iron, you have to melt the impurities also. So, what are the sources of impurities? Impurities are coming from iron ore, impurities are coming from your coke you have charged, impurities are coming from calcium carbonate that is a fluxus you have charged. And most of these impurities are basically silicates. So, you want to convert them into a molten form, so that I can also take it out. So, what happens? Your iron is much more heavier than your basically the molten slag. So, there is a gravity concentration method, there is a float sink effect. So, that is why you take out the slag from some layer that is at the upper portion and the molten slag which actually the molten iron is coming out from the bottom. And this is a continuous process. Okay. So, you are taking out your molten metal and you are taking out your slags and you are charging your basically the raw materials. Now, what are the raw materials? The materials going into the blast furnace are coke and coal, some portion of coal also we charge through the basically the two year region where from we are basically injecting the oxygen for creating for igniting our coal okay that because i think this is called coal dust injection no? yeah that is called pulverized coal injection pci that is called pulverized coal injection that is around 10% of non cooking coal we can use it through this route so that is the basically the developments in last 20 25 years it was not earlier there so that we can reduce the consumption of coke okay so that is basically called the pci and that is where you are basically injecting the blast of hot air in because this air I need to basically ignite my coal so that I can rise the temperature. So, along with that we are also injecting some fine dust coal that is your non cooking coal normally we try to use and that is around 10 percent of the total coal you are supplying that is called PCI pulverized coal injection. I am not going into that detail. Okay. So, basically coke and coal that is why I am writing that uh, raw materials are then iron ore, pellets and sinter that is why we are coming to the topic okay. that is wire we are using. So, and some form of scrap also we many times we fit scrap means the 
some pig iron or say some cast iron material which are basically thrown out or maybe some steel material which are no use. Say suppose your car, you are basically uh, it has expired its life. Now you are breaking the car and then you are getting the steel again. So, you want to recycle back that we call it scrap. Okay. So, the scrap also many times we feed and then we need to have fluxes that is dolomite or limestone why we need fluxes. Now, this will supply you the CAO and MGO because CaCO3 gets dissociated into CaO plus CO2 and that CO reacts with the silicate otherwise the melting point of silica is very high. So, you have to increase the temperature of the blast furnace. So, if I want to increase the temperature of blast furnace what will happen? So, my coke consumption will go up. So, my coke consumption goes up means my effective volume of my for iron extraction goes down and the energy cost goes up. So, that is why the CAO or MGO it converts the your silicates into calcium silicates or maybe magnesium silicate and then it brings down the temperature melting point of that basically the compound. Okay. So, that it also gets melted at the temperature where I wish to melt my iron. Okay. So, that is why we need to charge this dolomite or limestone also. Now, several reactions take place before the iron is finally produced. This is very important to understand to understand the significance of charging pellet and their uh, say what are the problems. So, what happens oxygen in the air reacts with coke to give carbon dioxide first C plus O2 you get CO2. These are all simplistic the blast furnace reactions are very complicated. This is also another example like your hydrocyclone. Uh, so, people claim that this is probably the one of the say largest piece of equipment say designed by human being, okay. but still it is like a black box say the, the best metallurgists they claim that probably we do not understand more than 5 percent of how it works, but it works, but we do not know how much of efficiency improvement we can do it, how do I fine tune it, this is very complicated piece of equipment in terms of understanding. Okay. So, then the limestone breaks down to form carbon dioxide that is CaCO3 dissociates it into CO2 plus CaO and this CO2 again and whatever CO2 we have generated this reacts with another coal particle that is your carbon and ultimately you get 2 CO. Now, so that means the gases are formed why we need these gases? Now, we have to reduce the iron that means we have to take out those yeah, uh, saturated hematite ore the formula is Fe2O3. So, I have to take out that oxygen from that. So, this CO basically reacts with that and then we get the metal to Fe plus 3 CO2 and this is also there are various forms of that first Fe2O3 gets converted into Fe3O4. Then we get FeO and uh, that is X term is there FeO is not stoichiometrically stable it is FeXO we say it varies from 0.95 to 0.97 that is called lustite then it gets converted into iron. Okay. That is how the stage wise reactions are there and that is why I said that these are the simplified forms of the equations. Okay. And the CaO produced from limestone reacts with the sand to form slag here the sand is a loose term to say that these are the impurities which are mostly silicates and we get calcium silicate could be magnesium silicate could be calcium aluminum silicate like that. Now, what is that essence what I am trying to show that is in a blast furnace. So, basically your effectiveness of your blast furnace depends on how homogeneously the gas gets distributed in that. What are these gases that is you must need CO2 and CO2 flow freely. So, what I have to do that is I have to have sufficient permeability in the bed. So, when I am charging the raw materials now what will happen if I have very coarse product. So, my reaction time that I will show you later also that is my reaction time means the Fe2O3 to get converted into Fe will take larger time. So, my kinetics will be slower. So, my capacity or productivity of my blast furnace will be reduced. So, my economics will get hampered. If it is too fine 
then my permeability of the bed will be reduced. So, my gas flow will be disturbed. So, again there may be some choking, there may be insufficient conversion of my iron ores and all this. So, again my capacity and all this will create a problem. So, I have to have a proper size distribution of all the raw materials that is number one. So, that is where again it is linked with mineral processing operation that is how do I control the sizes because when you are mining we hardly control the sizes. Okay. In a blasting operation what do we control? We control the mining engineers will agree with me we control on the only the topmost size because of my mining machinery I am using because that has to be accommodated into that. We do not control that how much of fines will be generating. Okay. So, then the material then the such metallurgist people they have given this some kind of your basically the uh, the specifications like for iron ore they say that it should be below 10 millimeter it creates problem into my permeability of my bed that is why at the very first uh, say the introductory session I say said that definition of fines and ultra fines it varies from minerals to minerals it is basically more of application specific and you are based on your availability of your technology to handle that. So, here in this case for iron ore we say minus 10 millimeter particles are fines, but in case of coal we say minus 0 0.5 millimeter they are fines. So, it depends on why we are calling them it could be basically the want of a technology to handle that size or maybe some other metallurgical problems are there. So, the below 10 millimeter particle you cannot charge. So, what will happen when you are mining? What you are going to do with the below 10 millimeter particle? Should I throw it? That is what basically the discussion is. <coughs> so, the raw materials used in blast furnace source of iron basically I need calibrated iron ore. Calibrated means properly sized iron ore that we call it lump it could be minus 40 plus 10 now people have even come down to minus 30 plus 8 mm many times because of control of this uh, sizes and all this. So, then these are basically becoming very very important one because what is happening now the mining techniques are being changed what mining people mining engineers are interested they want production. So, their objective when they are mining that is at the specified cut off grade how much of material I can mine per unit time. So, what they are going for they are going for much bigger machineries and all this. So, as a result you are generating more of fines. Okay. So, it is not a very such a selective mining operation and as because you are because so your objective is to increase the productivity. So, because of heavy machineries you are generating more fines and at the same time as you are going down the seam as we have discussed okay, your iron ore is becoming low grade. Low grade means the contamination of your nature of particles impurities which we do not want what they are we will talk about that and sometimes the grade of iron ore is also getting lower down. So, for liberation purposes I have to even cross it. So, when you are crossing again there will be some basically imprecision in my proper sizing. So, I will be generating more fines. Even when you are with the mined product when I need minus 40 plus 10 I have to cross the material because I may be having big boulders which are basically plus 40 mm. So, I want to generate minus 40 plus 10 what I do I take a crusher I have a screen. So, in that process also I am generating more fines. So, what we are going to do with that? So, for that metallurgists do not accept it. So, I have to bring it to this size limit that is your plus 10 mm minus 40 plus 10 within that size limit. So, for that these are the agglomeration processes which basically converts this fines into a bigger size material, but what are the conditions here? It is not like a flocculation process because in flocculation what we have discussed that is flocculation the my purpose is that to enlarge the size. 
so that I can separate it either by screening process or by settling process. But here this material will be charged from the height of a 100 feet. So when they are reaching the bottom, they should have sufficient strength so that they do not get broken again. Otherwise, my very purpose of agglomeration will be defeated. Okay? So, there is a strength also, the criteria is there. So, I cannot flocculate them because flocculates they do not have sufficient strength and you have got liquid in that. So, I cannot charge it. Okay? So, here the agglomeration processes are basically can be divided into sintering, pelletizing, hot vacuating, nodulizing, vacuum extruded ore, so many processes have come up. Out of these, these two are very popular sinter and pellets. Okay. Now, what are the fuels? We also charge coke, pulverized coal that is what I said that is your pulverized coal injections. Sometimes some hydrocarbons and tar etc like your oils also you can some furnace oil uh, the like uh, thing you can also charge to improve the ignitability of my at the two year region that is so that my coal burns immediately. Okay. Then fluxes, limestone and dolomite. So, the essential characteristics of the iron ore are first thing is that that is how do I evaluate at a reducibility. These are all very important to understand to understand the reason behind uh, going for say pelletization. That is why, why, why people are talking about pelletization to, today. Okay. That is because of this criteria also that is by iron ore should have a better reducibility. Reducibility means what is the kinetics of that reaction of those reactions. That is how fast we can convert my iron ore into an iron metal and that depends on the mineralogy, geological compositions and many other things. Okay. So, it is not fixed you have to measure you have to know that. Then size and size distribution we have already discussed. Okay. The strength again the iron ore strength is also very important that minus 40 plus 10 if I have very friable material and if it is falling from again 100 feet height and if it is getting fragmented then also my productivity will be compromised productivity will be slowed down. So, the strength of my material is also very important for that we have got different tests. Then temperature and range of softening that say suppose I get one iron ore where the mineralogy is such that it melts at around 1700 degrees centigrade, but your blast furnace you have designed it thinking that it will melt at 1539. So, what will happen again the consequences will come back that is your coke consumption will go up, your flux saturated consumption will go up because when you are charging more coal or coke that means you are charging more impurities with that. So, I need to charge more fluxes also for that. So, your effective volume will come down for the temperature rise your energy cost will go up like that. So, are the say actually the consequences and if some part of that basically softens that means it melts very fast then what will happen? I have shown you the temperature gradient at 400, 800 and all this. Now, say suppose that I have got some impurities which gets softened it is not melted it is like your some kind of your semi solid state at around 800 degree centigrade. So, what will happen? So, it may stick it may get stuck onto the side walls of my blast furnace and then what will happen? Over the time it will get accumulated and then a time will come when it will fall all of a sudden and my blast furnace could be choked that is called hanging scavenging and all this type of problems are there. Okay. Then your iron contained, moisture contained, gang contains, swelling and volume change. This is also very important because when you are charging your raw materials at temperature because temperature is very difficult to handle. You have to understand thermodynamics and the material characteristics also. So, what happens if my material starts swelling because I know that this is the effective volume my, of my blast furnace. Now, when it is the reaction occurs and if that volume expands then what will happen? There will be pressure on my side walls of my blast furnaces and there could be cracks on my walls of my blast furnaces and we may have accident, we may have some other problems. So, that how much is the volume expansion of that of that material at different temperatures whatever we are charging that also we must know otherwise I will have problem. 
So, there are tests for all these, you know, that is called swelling indexes and all this. There are tests, these are standard tests, even in RDCI, is that your say, uh, I am sure you are doing it on a regular basis, all these tests with RO nodes. Yeah, so there is, the, 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 there is a separate blast furnace research group. They have to monitor all these properties of raw materials. So, it is not that the mineral processing people, they have just removed the alumina and silica and they have sent it and they, th that is readily acceptable by the metallurgists. You have to look at some other parameters also, which are very, very important. Okay. Now, these are basically the physical properties. I have discussed reducibility is basically what it is and all this. You can go through all this because I have written it at uh, greater, uh, say actually end up descriptions are there. So, you can understand it properly. Okay. Now, chemical properties basically we have discussed here that is basically very, very important that is from a blast furnace point of view, what do we mean by iron ore processing? Okay. We have got the main problem with our Indian iron ore is not the great most of the cases. It is basically the nature of impurities and mainly the alumina. So, what happens this alumina, if I have more alumina in my iron ore, what is the problem? Okay. In one occasion when I was giving a talk on mineral processing, one gentleman asked me from Kevinger, he is a social activist and he was asking me that why it should be the responsibility of the mineral processing engineers. We are giving you the grade, so the metallurgists should handle it and the refining stages and all this, what is your opinion? I said that is fine, but we should not segregate it that this is the mining job, this is processing job, this is metallurgist job. Metallurgists can definitely handle that but their cost of handling will be much more than by physical separation. So, if we can remove this by physical separation, then my entire economics is better. But if I want, because what happens when my alumina goes there, one thing is the viscosity of my slag goes up. What does it mean? That means, the flowability of my slag and the blast furnace will be reduced. So, there is a kinetics that your entire balancing is there that is by mass balancing that what rate you will be charging your raw material that must be balanced at what rate your mass is going out. So, if that is slowed down, so you have to slow down your iron extraction also the even if it is molten you have to give more residence time for that to go out of the system and so that means you have to reduce your charging sequence also. So, what will happen your capacity will be compromised and then your melting point of this slag also goes up, shoots up. I will show you some data, how much of that and what will be the problem with that alumina and silica. So, entire basically the beneficiaries and challenges was Dr. Subramaniam was talking that is challenge lies here on the removal of alumina and silica. Okay. Now, advantage of using pellets, before I discuss what is pelletization, I will tell you that what are the advantages of using pellets. Okay. First thing is that what is problem that we call it minus 10 mm is the fine for iron ore and minus 150 micron that is minus that is finer than 0.15 millimeter we call it ultra fine. Till today I repeat till today we are dumping all this minus 150 micron in tailing ponds. Okay. Now, what is happening? It requires a lot of land. It is your national, say, say national say resources we are not able to properly utilize. And then many a times, because these are all ultra fine particles. So, if you leave them like free, then what will happen? Then it will pollute my air, because they are very fine dust below 150 micron means there will be 1 micron, 5 micron, 2 micron, any sorts of particles will be there. So, to prevent that we are using water. Now, what is happening? There will be some leaching. The leach and where it will go? It will contaminate your ground water. So, there will be a ground water contamination if you are using water to suppress them. If you do not use water, then your air pollution will be there. And there are many other consequences and we are losing lot of value in that. Okay. How much I will come to that. So, how do I use it? Now, then if I can agglomerate them by some process, 
then we can use it. Okay. But what is happening? The most of these alumina and silica they are associated with my iron ore in the form of clay and clay is the naturally occurring material. Now, clay by virtue of its formation they are very fine sizes even they are most of the time below 40 micron below 20 micron and different varieties of clays are there. Now, what will happen this concentration of these clays then they are more in the finer fraction. So, that means my minus 150 micron particle are having more of aluminous silica than my coarse R particles. That is why we hardly have to process minus 40 plus 10 mm, they are only the sizing is required. But now a trend has come that many times even we are thinking or some of the plants I am not fully aware they are having also some jigging process for that even for the lump beneficiation and mostly I think or maybe some scrubbing or this type of processes because many lumps they are adhered to the surfaces of my coarse particles. So, you have to dislodge them either by shaking or by shear forces that is called scrubbing. Okay. But minus 10 mm that is there are three categories here. So, we are calling it minus 40 plus 10 is the lump that I can directly sell it to the steel plant and they can directly charge it to the blast furnace. Minus 10 plus 0.15 mm that is called the sinter fines that means we can convert it into a sintering process that I will briefly discuss and that has been in the existence for last 30 years that already our steel plants they have got a sintering unit most of our steel plants in our country. I am not talking about only sale but most of other steel plants also they have got a sintering one. But below 150 micron in sale that is the largest say, steel producer in the government sector they do not have a pelletization plant yet okay. they are thinking. But some of our private players they are having okay, the this pelletization one. So, this minus 10 plus 150 micron people are basically processing because of removal of alumina and all this. But minus 150 micron the problem is the size because at that size the separation becomes very very critical and that is where the entire I do not know research is getting concentrated and here you see that most of you are interested in knowing iron ore beneficiation and pelletization is basically to sum up that I will say that is how do I utilize my highness say actually minus 150 micron particles that has become a challenge to the uh, mineral processing metallurgist and all sorts of people and even the mining people. So, because there are certain advantages associated with this using these pellets. DR cleans because apart from blast furnace there is alternative route of iron making is through basically the sponge iron route we call it sponge iron but sponge iron is not I do not think it is a technically correct word we should say directly reduced iron. Why we call them sponge iron because there we can use non cooking coal also. What do we try to do we do not want to melt my iron, but we want to remove majority of my oxygen by reacting it with the source of carbon. So, when my oxygen is coming out my iron ore leaves a porous body. So, that is why we used to call them sponge iron, but it is not like a say actually it does not retain the property of a sponge only based on the your visual. Uh, uh, so, observation of that we used to name it sponge iron many many places we even call that such there is a sponge iron plant. So, nothing wrong in that, but technically it is not correct we should say directly reduced iron. So, here what happens basically when you charge pellets in place of your iron ore. So, what happens the pellets basically you have agglomerated your ultrafines. So, you can control the porosity of that that means that is the porosity within the pellet. So, when it happens and then you can control the sizes of that that is basically the challenge how do I control the sizes of my pellets. So, what happens so, suppose if I have got and the shape also shape they are almost spherical. So, if I have almost all the spherical particles of almost a very close size range. So, my permeability of the bed goes up. So, when my permeability of the bed increases, so my gas flowability increases, so my reaction kinetics are very fast, so my production will go up. 
So that's why I said that 20 to 30 percent increase in production from rotary kiln. There are basically different processes. The metallurgy student they will learn in terms uh, in uh, gradually in their courses. Reduction in specific consumption of coal because when the kinetics is fast, so to produce one ton of metal, I need also lesser amount of coal. So your cost of production also goes down. Longer campaign life due to less accretion and these are so many benefits there and no losses in handling iron ore as pellets will not break during transport of handling. But that we have to ensure in the pelletization plant that it has got certain strength and it should not break while handling, while charging and all this. That is why you require to invest your uh, say time in developing technologies that how do I increase the strength of a pellet uh, that is what my second part of this lecture is that is how the pellet forms, what is the mechanics of pelletization that is more fundamentals of the pelletization that is what I want to talk in the next lecture. Okay. Advantage of using pellets in blast furnace, it is standardization that is what I said. You can control, you can have uniform size range generally within a range of 9 to 16 millimeter. Okay. So, that size range I can generate and this is a man made one, this is a tailor made one, this is an engineered product. So, if we have proper technology, we can deliver the right kind of sizes, right kind of strengths what the metallurgy people demand. Okay. So, this is not a nature made thing, this is a man made thing. Purity 63 to 68 percent iron mainly Fe2O3. Why we are saying this? No, because as I will discuss that why you need even minus 150 micron you cannot directly pelletize them. You have to further grind them. See this is what we say, I, I say that is it really a technology? That is what I ask myself even many times, but I do not have alternative suggestions. I have got a problem with my fine size. I want to enhance its size, for that again I want to break it to a finer sizes and from a minus 150 micron to bring it to below minus 63 micron, we consume more energy even in the pelletization process itself. Okay. Anyway, so what we are trying to do here, here basically we try to convert that iron as purest in the form of that we can achieve the hematite because we want to get rid of my alumina and silica. So, a pelletization plant at least for Indian ore has to be linked with a beneficiation plant because we have to beneficiate that minus 150 micron particle. We have to remove that alumina silica otherwise again the very purpose of charging the pellets will be defeated because you will be incorporating more of alumina and silica into the blast furnace. So, you will not get the advantage rather you will be charging only the impurities in the form of pellets. Nobody is going to charge that, no metallurgist will accept that. And the problem here that is why our steel industry has not basically uh, adopted this pelletization route. Although the technology is there for last 30, 40 years, it is not a new technology, the pelletization. But the problem is with the beneficiation, problem is with that you are basically the processing how do I process. So, you see that I have got a technology and I need that to be adapted, but I do not know because of another technology we cannot do anything. Okay. This uh, example is coming to my mind, I will tell you that is what technology can do. You know and before 1900 there was a period for 20, 30 years, the copper ore what we are mining, they have all around the world, they have become so lean grade that you have to grind it to very finer sizes for liberation below 40 micron, below 60 micron. And that time people were not knowing that how to upgrade it. So, what happened? Because there was no technology, almost all the copper productions around the world they seized we had to stop mining for copper, we had to stop extraction of copper and that is when the emphasis on alumina has uh, say aluminum has come for our your say conductivity related applications you know. 
that is where the stress on aluminum has started. But that time people were researching on that and the successful development of froth flotation technique are there in Australia <coughs> in 1900. They demonstrated that in plant scale level you can apply froth flotation technique to upgrade my say actually the copper ores. And because of that froth flotation <coughs> technique that innovation of that process again the copper industry has come back. Again you started mining, again you started your extraction plants and all this. So that is why the in the year 2000 the entire world celebrated the froth flotation technology your um, as a centenary year and that one technology has helped you to basically deal with many many fine particles not only copper in other areas also. So, here we have got palletization. So, people are now under hard press all over the world that is how do I get rid of this aluminum and silica at that finer sizes. Many processes have come up but still people it is not basically uh, say specific they are all specific to a particular type of iron ore or we do not have a genetic process. Okay. So, the entire world is researching on that. Even in Australia they have got a huge deposit almost more than they are 50 percent of their proven or say your proven deposit of iron ore they are not even started mining because you know there is for another reason that they have got high phosphorus and you know how high they are they are only around 0.5 percent of phosphorus and I need for metallurgical extraction less than 0 0.05 percent phosphorus. So, we are talking about and the entire world till today we do not know how to handle that phosphorus. So, they are researching. So, if you have any good idea that okay, I can remove phosphorus by this way you just contact CSIRO or maybe you can contact me I will give you the contact who is the leading the iron ore research in CSIRO Australia um, you will be getting a job maybe you get a, the highest award in, you know if you have the solution for that. And because of that lack of technology of handling 0.5 percent phosphorus they cannot mine and more than 50 percent of their deposit just sitting idle very high grade iron ore good quality iron ore only problem is that phosphorus. Okay. So, the purity goes up 63 to 68 percent thinking that we have beneficiated there is an if. Okay. Then cost effectiveness virtually no loss on ignition while high and uniform porosity of 25 to 30 percent allows fast reduction and high metal edges rate. What does it mean? That means what is the conversion rate that is called the reducibility that is I have got Fe2O3. So, stoichiometrically I have got 70 percent of Fe. Now, given the residence time that is you have designed your blast furnace or maybe kiln that I will give a residence time of this much. Now, within that time whether your all 70 percent has converted into metal or not that is called the reducibility and all this conversion factor because otherwise what will happen that metal is basically in the form of slag it is going out. So, you will be losing that metal in the form of slag you would not be able to get it as a metal. So, here in this case when you are charging pellets we have got permeability of the bed gas flow is uniform. So, my reductibility is much much better than when I am charging your lump iron nodes. Okay. Then strength high and uniform mechanical strength even under thermal stress in reducing atmospheres as I said that this is the response this is what we should have in the pellet. Okay. Transportable low degradation under abrasive influences. So, these are the properties we need. So, what is sintering? I will just brief about it. So, sinter making is a method of fusing iron ore fines into larger particles suitable for charging into the blast furnace. How do I do it? Now, when you have lump materials, we first try to enhance their particle to particle contact by some kind of your sucking the bed or something like that and then we try to fuse it. So, the particle layers that is if I have two iron ores particle like this and they are in contact. So, I am forcing them so that this gets reduced they are in contact 
and if you heat it up at around 1200 degree centigrade to 1300 degree centigrade below the melting point of iron ore, partially these layers they get molted and they get diffused and when you are cooling them that is called incipient fusion. That means they are having a temporal bond because of your partial melting and fusing it with each other. So, that is how your sintered are made and then you basically put into a screen and screen them of your sizes and send it. Okay. So, that is a basically in short the sintering process and this technology was developed for the treatment of the waste fines in the early 20th century. Since then sinter has become the widely accepted and preferred blast furnace burden material. How many of you have so visited a steel plant? Okay. Have you seen the sintering plant? Yeah, the best sintering plant what I have seen in sale that uh, so long back that is in say under sale there is the Bokaru steel plant properly maintained I do not know what is the health now, but when I found uh, that time there is no dust. But mostly if you are in a sintering plant <coughs> the notion is that you have to encounter with a lot of dust, <coughs> but the modern sintering plants they do not have even dust. The recent very recent I have seen it in the also so that is not under sale that is by Bruce and steel they are having 6.8 million tons of your so productivity that is very huge steel plant the sintering plant even you can just walk in wearing a white shirt nothing will happen to you if they are operating all your dust catchers and everything okay that is what is not in most of the cases okay. So, presently more than 70 percent of hot metal in the world is produced through the sinter what is the benefit again the benefit is that that is you can use heavy machineries do not have to you do not have to worry that whether I am getting minus 40 plus 10 during mining. So, that you can increase your productivity of your iron ore and because of the added benefit of using sintered because you can control the porosity of the bed in a much better way. So, your reducibility of your iron ore is much higher in a sintered product than your lump ore. So, the, so, so these are the benefits and people are using more than 70 percent of this hot metal using sintered. Large sinter stands 6 meter wide and with the sintering these are basically based on the capacities. Okay. Now, the major advantages of using sinter in blast furnace are use of iron ore fines that is less than 10 mm. You can use even coke bridges that is when you are sintering you can sinter some of the coke fines also because in the coke making process also you will be generating some fines of that. Why do I utilize it? Now, you can sinter them along with the basically iron ore and that helps in reduction also. So, it increases my reducibility. So, that is the benefit and you can add some kind of flux also that is called self flux and they are using basically now everybody uses fluxes also. So, metallurgical waste, lime, dolomite or hot metal production and even in the sintering process you can use some uh, some amount of fines or ultra fines also. Okay. Better reducibility and other higher temperature properties, increased blast furnace productivity due to higher softening temperature and lower softening melting temperature range, improved quality of hot metal because of conversion, because of purity of the material because you can beneficiate it, okay. then reduction in coke rate in blast furnaces. Now, future of sintering and pelletizing that is probably the future that is you have to go more of sintering and pelletization processes because of the added advantages and more than that that is you will be producing more of these files and ultra files. I will have some data also where I will show you that what is the but basically why I have to maximize the consumption of iron ore files. Now, these are the data It is about 56 percent of iron ore production comes out as files when you are mining that is they are below 10 millimeter and 44 percent as big boulders which have to be sized that is they are plus your say 40 mm. Okay. So, what happens that is 10 to 30 mm for blast furnaces we require 6 to 18 mm for sponge iron plants and this has to be crossed. So, what is happening that is your net result in final analysis 65 to 70 percent of total iron ore production lands as fines either after sizing or handling then when you are transporting the material you will all be also be generating some fines. Okay. So, lumps are around this. So, this is the ratio even 
generation of oils is more in Goa and Karnataka where ore is friable. The ore is friable means it gets degraded very easily, they are soft material. Ultimate ratio of lumps to fines in Goa and Karnataka may work out to be 20 is to 80. So, what you are going to do if you only concentrate on lumps minus 40 plus 10 or maybe minus 30 plus uh, 10, then you have to throw out 80 percent of your material. So, you have to use sintering processes, you have to add up palletization processes, okay. Otherwise, yeah, it is not sustainable and uh, environmental problems will be there, economically also it will not be viable. So, this is the future that your future lies here. So, the metallurgist, people whoever uh, uh, is willing to see a career in extractive metallurgy, I would request them to concentrate more on this part, agglomeration part, okay? that is technology, basics, fundamentals and all this and this will be huge demand. Because today the problem is that our metallurgy students, they are getting converted into material scientists. Not many extractive metallurgists, we are getting it and our industry is, will be running short of good quality extractive metallurgists very soon. Okay? So, this is the future for that. Now, as I said that we have to beneficiate iron ore for that is the challenge here than the technology in agglomeration. That is, how do I get rid of your impurities from iron ores? Okay? Now, you go to any national laboratory these days dealing with mineral processing, their main focus 90 percent of their projects are on iron ore processing, iron ore beneficiation. Okay? The reason is that that is a simple metallurgical calculations I have shown. So, suppose 40 to 50 kg of silica per ton of hot metal is removed from ore. Suppose I do not have even alumina, I have only silica, I have to remove. If I remove that, then limestone requirement for fluxing decreases by 100 to 130 kg, because you have to add that much of your CAO. So, that is basically to remove 40 to 50 kg, I need to add 100 to 130 kg of limestone and decreases slag volume of 100 kg. Okay? and decreases in the amount of CO2 to be removed into endothermic calcination reaction by about 50 kg, because the CO plus CO2 it is endothermic. Endothermic means you have to again supply extra heat, that means more carbon, more carbon means more coal, but my main aim is to extract iron. So, my effective volume will be reduced. Net result, coke saving of about 40 to 60 kg per ton of hot metal and a simultaneous increase in the production by 5 to 10 percent. That is, if I remove 40 to 50 kg of silica per ton of hot metal, that is the advantage and you can work out what will be the economics. Okay? And if we can separate them based on physical property differences, that is the cheapest means. That is where the mineral processing can play huge, huge role. This is what in my uh, very first lecture I wanted to say, that is in one occasion I have given this lecture, that is in this industry, the mining people and metallurgy people, they think that we are the big brothers and mineral processing is like a younger brother, but I think they are going to be the head of the family, they will run the show. Without that, there is no point in mining, because if it is not sellable, uh, what is the point? And if the metallurgy people, they are not having good quality raw materials, what they will be doing with their plants? So, the future is huge in mineral processing, but provided you have got sufficient knowledge and you can deliver something innovative, now new technologies, not having only basic knowledge in mineral processing is going to help you. Okay? You have to have some kind of your innovative thinking. So, problems with Indian iron ores, that is certain Indian ores with 60 to 65 percent Fe, you look at the purity. Theoretically, I can have 70 percent Fe in hematite, even at a 65 percent that means more than 92 percent of purity, which mineral you get of such a pure one. So, we are blessed with that good reserve, even we get many like your Belladilla and all this, they have this much of iron, but still we say that it is of no use unless we go for beneficiation, the processing removal. Because the 60 to 65 percent Fe contain large amounts of alumina in the gang, which when smelted give a high 
as a, as a actually viscous slag and it is very difficult to work with such slags and the removal of alumina from the ore if possible should increase the furnace output, lower the coke rate and improve the iron quality. Now, it is not only the alumina, it is the alumina silica ratio is also very important because say, suppose if I have removed all the alumina, but silica remains there, then what will happen? Again that equation will come back that is. So, it is the alumina silica because then only it can make alumino silicates. So, that my melting point of that goes down. Okay. So, I have to remove, I have to maintain the alumina silica ratio and the ore is more important than their individual percentages. Maintaining this ratio close to 1 is one of the most important research topic these days. And this is the final value that 1 percent reduction of alumina in iron ore. Benefit is around 100 crores per annum for a 3 million ton per annum steel plant. Now, even if we say that it is flocculation, let us see our flocculation on that any process, if you guarantee that you can remove alumina by 2 to 3 percent, it will all be economically viable because the see the saving in your basically the in your production okay, is a huge, huge figure and that is only for a 3 million ton per annum. Okay. So, it is per million ton it will be around 33 crores of saving and this data is also little bit old data, it depends on what is the market price of your iron and all this. Okay. The figure could be somewhat in the upper side. Now, you look at the beneficiation of iron ore, what are the challenges, I will just tell you a bit that is how this technology is getting complicated with the demand with the nature of my material. I will just try to show you some flow sheets. I am not going to discuss that why they are and what we can do. It is not a, uh, it's a, it's a basically the very purpose of my talk. So, initial phases when we started this beneficiation that is your processing. So, mainly what we used to do we get the run of mine ore, then the lump one that is your multi stage crusher we used to screen them of course, whatever the lump is there minus 40 plus 10. So, only the beneficiation part I am showing not the preparation part. Then you have got a scrubber that means to take out the adhered alumina on the surfaces of the particle. Then you put it in the wet screen, you get plus 40 mm particle that is again you are sending back to your crusher that is called the basically the recirculating load on the crushers minus 40 plus 10 directly is your lump product that you can directly sell it and minus 10 mm we, what will happen minus 10 mm I will be having minus 10 and minus 150 micron that I want to separate that means I want to have two product minus 10 plus 0.15 and minus 0.15 because minus 0.15 is my basically the ultra fines for which we are unable to process that is what I said that this was the scenario. So, you have got a classifier that is normally a basically your screw classifier or rake classifier we used to use not cyclones because you are dealing with much coarser sizes. So, that is what we have discussed probably you remember those pictures. Okay. So, these are very common in iron ore processing even you go to Goa and other iron ore processing units you will get this type of classifiers and there basically the sand means is basically the your minus 10 plus 150 micron that is basically the your the center fines okay. and the overflow is the fines that is minus 150 micron it used to go to the tailing pond dump it and we are having so much of iron contained in that and that is still we are doing it even today we are doing it that. So, then people have started realizing and because of technology and all this, this percentage of this has started going up. Now, it is around even many cases it is around 25 to 30 percent of this ultra fines they are coming. If you are using heavy machineries and if your ore is friable many times it is not uncommon that you are having minus 150 micron is around 25 percent to 30 percent. Okay. It is a huge loss and there are other consequences what we have already discussed. Then people have started doing research, they are basically now proposing different flow sheets, much more intense flow sheets. What are the basically the unit operations have come into picture? That is more of gravity concentrations like your spirals, they have come into picture. Now, even the 
basically the magnetic separators. Although hematite is very weakly magnetic, but still you can use very high intensity magnetic field like your 20,000 Gauss that we call it high gradient magnetic separator, weight high intensity magnetic separator. These are all being tried and in a uh, couple of our uh, private uh, iron ore mines mainly in Goa they are uh, they have already installed this magnetic separators and they are claiming that they are getting good results okay. And basically the entire now attempt is to upgrade by you see the pellet feed fines has come. So, that is entire complexity has been there is because of your minus 150 micron that is how do I separate my clays from there. So, that is the uh, technologies are being tried, but still that no particular flow sheet I can use it that for all sorts of your iron ore fines or slime treatment. Okay. That is where even the TRDDC and other research centers they are working, your cell RDCIS they are all working on that, many people are working. Okay. Now, iron ore slime verification if I zoom into that, that is one of the techniques we are using. Now, slime that is basically minus 150 micron, you first have a truss screen that is whatever the coarse one you are removing it and then oversized material that is basically truss material because when I have a finer circuit, if I have a bigger particle it may choke. So, I want to get rid of that. Then you are basically we are going for multi-stage disliming as many times we can use a different types of cyclone classifier also. Now, you need a hydrocyclone because your now sizes has gone down. Minus 10 plus 0.15 I can easily use your screw classifier, rake classifier where I use normal G forces, but here I need centrifugal forces. That is why again the hydrocyclones are getting its basically again the application domain in basically the iron ore industry very very big way. But here the problem is that with the using the hydrocyclone that because you have got clay, so viscosity is a very big problem. So, that is your slurry rheology you must be very very thorough and I must have some kind of your say your uh, such some chemicals maybe we have to try for as a viscosity modifier. I am not ever who is working on that because still I have not uh, been engaged in research on iron ore slimes classification because I have not got any sponsor yet, but if there is I am very much interested to take it okay, to accept it. Then multi-stage disliming then we are sending it to your basically magnetic separations and then basically you are having your pellet feed concentrate. Again you can have composite tailings now minus 150 micro now we are saying that even uh, a country like Australia they are successfully processing for last 15 years uh, below 150 micro. Of course, their mineralogy is slightly different than ours, but even they are not able to process below 10 micron. So, even there is a restriction minus 150 micron plus 10 micron and minus 10 micron again they are trying to develop technologies. To be honest I am not uh, basically familiar with the literature whether it is a recently they have solved that problem or not. So, you please check it okay, for updating your knowledge. So, that is what we are calling it composite tailings. Okay. Now, basically <laughs> these are the problems with the sizes. Okay. Now, current trend of iron ore beneficiation you see the unit operation not much there is hardly any innovation on designing of new equipment that is what I want to stress upon that is you are trying to basically the innovation here in this field where you say that okay, magnetic separation we are using it for beach sand minerals and for other purposes and someone has done research and has shown it that okay, if I increase the intensity of that I can use it for my iron ore processing. That is not basically an innovative technique you are finding the existing equipment for other applications. What I think that we need to look at some kind of your innovative way of looking at the problem. We may have to come out with a new type of equipment because the entire research what we are trying that is whether I can use that equipment which is being applied for other purposes for iron ore like that and we are trying to optimize it, we are not looking at the entire problem. So, for that we have to deal with the more fundamental work because 
we need some innovation in technologies and you see for whenever min mineral processing people they are facing any problem they are thinking that okay now what i have seen the teeter weight separator uh, somewhere i wrote you know that whether i can use a teeter weight separator whether i can use a magnetic separator whether i can use a gravity concentration what are the new techniques coming what are the new concepts coming so i personally think that probably we need some innovative way of looking at the problem but that i have not come across in literature where uh, the research groups are working on some innovative ways or maybe they are not publishing that okay because the innovative work the people never publish it okay that is what with the young mineral processing engineers i am requesting that try to look at this rather than looking at that whether the magnetic separator will be useful on that okay people have done it what you can do it you can model it you can say okay for this ore it will work for this ore it will not work but there will be inefficiencies of that okay can i not handle this entire problem with some kind of looking from different perspectives okay can i not control my generation of this ultra fast even in the mining stage that is what i say that is why don't you integrate but we are basically working on isolated manner that is exploration geologist or geologist people will identify the resource that is their domain they don't talk to a mining engineer mining engineer will be mining they will be planning their mining even they hardly consult mineral processing engineers even planning them so mineral processing engineers when they are setting up the plant they don't have any idea what kind of ore they are going to get and for over the next 20 years they don't have detail so they take an average a bigger boundary conditions and they say okay as some kind of your compromised flow sheet okay if i have this i will i can handle but in any process any event i will be losing some materials and that i have accepted that mineral processing process i cannot process 100 percent of this material i will be losing some so if we integrate all this and then say suppose we try to generate less fines even in the production stage then my process uh, uh, say actually the processing uh, say problems will be reduced like that we have to think of can we not think of some kind of leaching technique can we not think of some other way of breaking rocks where i will be generating more uh, less, say actually less fines that is what i am saying that i i have no idea otherwise i would have taken it up okay but young minds i ask you i request you to think of in this different way don't always think of in a conventional way that okay i have tried this i have tried this then we conclude no no this iron ore is not beneficial or yes we have designed a flow sheet what you have designed flow sheet designing is what you have got existing equipment you have just put them together and you have run it and you have seen that whether it can deliver it or not that's it what is your intellect is coming nowhere that is what I am urging, I am just trying to ignite you, not to criticize you because here you means uh, say I am also included, okay? I am also part of that. So that is all about the first half of this lecture, then we will talk about the palletization fundamentals. Okay? What is palletization, how do you do it and what are the issues, you know, the fundamental issues. Okay. Thank you very much.